Uh, so what are your thoughts about the Dallas Police Association endorsing Ron Natinsky um, before anybody else filed? And uh, were you surprised? Or? A little bit. I was, I was curious what he promised them that would cause both <laughs> he and the fire to endorse him because, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I just think this is something that he can't deliver or shouldn't deliver. Do, I mean, do, you, do you know something we don't? I mean, what do you think the promise is? Well, I, I mean, they're... They're going to, the police and fire associations interest are only about themselves. I mean, they're, they're an advocacy group which is intended to improve the pay, benefits, and working conditions for officers and firefighters. And I'm, I mean, they're, they're, they're a union. I mean, they're, they're, they're not, their goals aren't, you know, how can we enhance public safety in the city of Dallas? Is how can we, you know, make our lives better as police officers? And I don't falter for that. It's, it's, uh, I just don't know what he could have done because previously, you know, they've done forums. I may have had difficulty getting their support because as a police chief, I didn't do my job like it was a popularity contest. I, uh, before I became chief, I made decisions that they disagreed with and uh, uh, with use of force, emergency driving, uh, disappointing officers, and was public about that. And so, you know, we fought about those issues the whole time I was chief. Do you believe the union speaks for the members? Uh, in this no, case, I mean? No, I, uh, they, they um, when, you, when you're in management, a lot of time the labor groups aren't happy with you. I, particularly if you're in a tough industry, like uh, you know, policing is tough, the airlines are tough, uh, you know, where, you, where you're, you know, so, so they, they gave me no confidence vote about four or five years ago and uh, met afterwards and I could tell they really didn't have the, but my comment was that they don't have the confidence of uh, the department either. There are I think nine different police unions that represent different members. There's a group almost as big as the DPA which formed because those guys didn't like the DPA and I don't know that I, I'm pretty much convinced if they had to choose me or their own association leaderships to lead them, they'd probably pick me rather than them. Okay. So. Uh, well, let's talk a little bit about the other candidates and how, um, I mean, you've set yourself apart, of course, as not being a CEO or kind of businessman that we've seen in the past. Uh, what specifically sets you apart from Ron Natinsky and Mike Rawlings that why people should vote for you instead. Okay. Uh, it may seem small, but, but I don't think it is. I, I live in a real Dallas neighborhood. I live off a block and a half off of Greenville, um, lower Greenville, in a, in, a, in a neighborhood where most of the houses were built 100 years ago. So I experienced all the city has to offer, good and bad. It's a very urban area. In the course of being a police chief, I've been in every neighborhood in the city. Uh, I know the people who live in the neighborhoods. I see uh, what their problems are and have relationships there that I think will translate to votes. I, I brought the city together around the issue of, of race uh, when that hadn't happened before in the police department. That uh, when I left the, um, the, the most uh, vocal civil rights uh, community leaders, um, talked about what a great job I had done. I, I um, was an assistant city manager and so I understand operations. I, managed and in fact most of the time I was a police chief or in the city manager's office have been bad financial times and I know how city budgets are put together and where you can find efficiencies and uh, also um, I'm running as a uh, an outside guy and I, I was pretty sure that I would do that when I announced that um, because of what I would talk about and, and uh, that I, I wouldn't get the you know, the big downtown Dallas money, so that's going to separate me from the other candidates. Okay. And uh, we talked a little bit about your, how charismatic you may or may not be. <laughs> um, and, uh, but I also wanted to ask how you might redefine the role as a mayor, uh, because it seems in the past it's been sort of a salesman type of position where the uh, officials beneath are the ones who actually get a lot of things done. And, of course, you have to have everybody's vote and that kind of thing. Um, is that how you would lead as more of a salesman or would you try to take it a different <laughs> approach as far as uh, leading the city? 
You know, I, I, I think I would be more hands-on than uh, my predecessors, but not as hands-on in a micromanaging way. I've, I've, you know, I've run big organizations, but but is helping the councils fulfill their uh, responsibility, which is uh, driving policy. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you look at the budget, which is going to be one of the most critical issues, I believe, confronting the city, because I think we have a structural deficit. I don't think we're just dealing with a under the year or two of financial problems, I believe that you know revenues are going to be less than expenditures in the city, and so the council is going to have to play a much stronger role. Typically, what what's happened in the city budget is the budgets budgets rolled out about the middle of August. Uh, the council has two or three meetings on the budget, and most of those are not very uh, productive because by the time. The mayor and each council member speaks. You can spend two or three hours just having somebody talking about an issue. Then there tends to be one uh, hot button issue or a couple in the budget that you know maybe a couple hundred thousand dollars expenditure that, that that most of the time is spent on that gets resolved. The budget's approved with virtually no change from the previous year, and I don't think that can continue uh, in bad economic times. You know the budget. Um, based on my limited financial experience, is pretty complicated to try and figure out. Yes. Is there a way to simplify it, or is that just the nature of city budgeting? Uh, you can look at where the biggest dollars are going and then see if there's opportunities to, to change that shift over time. You know, how much money is going to debt, um, you know, uh, maintenance items, things like that. But you, you can make sense of it. If you look, it's hard to do if you look at individual departments because they, they tend to get reorganized or people move around or even comparative data is kind of hard from city to city because they uh, cities put different things in their budgets in different ways. But, you know, I, I think in the city of Dallas, you look at, uh, you know, what is, you know, where I would start is, you know, how much debt are we paying and how, you know, how can we begin to shift this so more money goes into operations and how much, and look at where the city is partnering with different entities and whether those partnerships are still appropriate for the city to be doing. I know one thing Mayor Leppert started talking about right before he hit the road was pensions at the city, city pension, you know, city employee pension fund and how it's constructed and how expensive it is. Any thoughts on that since you were part of the city, I guess, as an employee. Yeah, it's and I'm, I'm uh, obviously would be conflicted because I have a City of Dallas pension, but uh, there were some changes voted on by the membership which are supposed to help fix some of the pension issues. It makes the Dallas Police and Fire Pension less lucrative for the members and, and less costly to fund. Uh, I don't know if that will fix it or not. Uh, I know at one point, and this is going, I think, even before my time, the pension was set up to induce people to work for the city and sort of because it was assumed that city jobs were lower right. paying. I don't know if that's the case anymore, but I do know that the pension relative to Social Security or like the rest of us get is, is a pretty good deal, it seems like. It is. It's, and, and I'm not trying to argue either point, but um, if, if you're a member of the Dallas Police and Fire Pension, you pay 8.5% of your uh, income into the pension. And, and if you're a member of the DPD pension, you almost certainly will get no Social Security. So if you, you know, then you have to determine if, it, if, if it's a good deal or not because, you know, if you take out what you would get in Social Security from what somebody in the pension and then what they contribute, um, part of what happens in the pension is that, you know, pensions are based, I think, on a funding cycle of 50 years. And assumptions are made, and, and if you know, a few years ago, people were assuming that um, that you'd get a 10% return on your investment right. annually, and and all those assumptions were wrong, and so now pensions are, are underfunded, um, and that and that's you know, some of those assumptions were were uh, overly optimistic, and then when um, so that's creating a lot of the problems you see in, in the pensions today throughout the country. You know, this budget cycle of the city versus last year's budget cycle, which one do you think will be worse in terms of trying to make, make the dollars match up with the revenue? Uh, this should be better. Uh, the council passed a five-cent property tax increase, which you, you would certainly think would generate. Uh, it's not like, you know, you're, you're, you know that's a, should, uh, on his face, 
solve the budget problems. Uh, so no worries? No, no, there would be big worries. I, I think, you know, from what the city is saying, I, I believe that uh, there will continue to be problems. The city is going to be affected by the cuts made in state and federal governments, uh, money that may have been passed through. The, I don't think the property tax rolls have seen their final, you know, particularly on the commercial side, you know, they, they have a lag of two or three years from, you know, when, when the property values actually go down. And, and then, uh, I don't know about the sales tax. Uh, you know, that's a lot of the sales tax revenue is built around how optimistic uh, consumers are, and I don't know that the bad news is over yet in the economy. I got a, just a couple of random questions before we finish up. And you know, Mayor Leopard's chief of staff was Chris Heimbaugh, former TV reporter anchor, and you happen to be married to a former TV reporter anchor. Any, what kind of a role would Sarah have in your administration if you were, if you're elected? Uh, she, she has been very active as a volunteer in the campaigns, uh, which is, I think anybody runs for office, their spouse is probably as involved as they are, but, but she would play no role in uh, uh, policies or anything else if I were to be, get elected. Uh, We've, uh, she all the consulting work she was doing, she quit doing during the campaign, and would any of the city of Dallas st stuff. If I were to get elected, we, she would not do. And then I've read that you have a son. I, I don't know that I know the age or any any details you'd care to give us on your family there. Yeah, I, I have a son who is uh, 35, and he has uh, three children. He live around here or somewhere else? Or he lives in uh, the Tarrant County, northeast Tarrant County area. Doing very well. So. Not following in your political or city steps? Uh, no, not at all. Not at all. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, I think we'll leave it there. And that concludes our advocate video podcast. Uh, thanks, uh, Mr. Kunkel, for being with us. Okay. All right.